And now, stay tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. End of the Road. It was night on Fountain Avenue in Hollywood, but the darkness was pierced with shafts of light from police car spotlights, and there was a crowd pushing forward, babbling excitedly, turning the usually quiet residential section into a bedlam. A siren wailed as another police car swung around the corner and ground to a stop, and its uniformed occupants leaped out, ready for action. And it was about that time that Doris Chandler pushed her way to the front of the crowd. Pardon me, please. Close enough to hear the conversation of the officers, intent on the small white bungalow now bathed in the searchlights. That's Jaeger. It was then, wasn't it, Doris, uh, yeah, that yeah. you heard the name sure. of the criminal they yeah. trapped inside. As an officer explained to one who had just arrived. It's Jaeger, Mac. Steve Jaeger. The cop killer? Right. We got a telephone tip on him about half an hour ago. You sure he's inside, huh? The boys in the first squad car got a look at him through the window. They put in the alarm when he started throwing slugs. Armed, huh? This won't be easy. Ah, we'll wait him out and then try tear gas. You got the loudspeaker ready, Dave? All set. Go ahead. Attention, Jaeger. Steve Jaeger. This is a warning. Come out on the front porch. Throw your gun away. You haven't a chance. The house and the entire block are surrounded. Jaeger, this is a final warning. Come out and throw your gun away. We'll give you one minute. One minute, Jaeger, to decide. It's all you need to hear, isn't it, Doris? And you ease back through the crowd... Hurry from the scene to your own apartment only a few blocks away. It's all over for Steve Yeager, you're certain. And the money, Steve's money, hidden in your apartment, will belong to you now. Yes, a fitting reward for your cleverness in phoning in that anonymous tip to the police. Safely inside your apartment, you lower the shades and smile to yourself as you think of what's happening to Steve just a few short blocks away. And then... Yes? Hi, sis. It's me, Charlie. Oh, Charlie. Glad you called. Just wanted to make sure my little sister's okay. Why wouldn't I be? Well, haven't you heard? It's on the radio. Steve Yeager. Steve? What about him? Oh, it's all right. Nothing to worry about. Only I didn't even know the guy was in town. They got him trapped in a house someplace. The cops. Steve Yeager? Trapped? Uh-huh. Good thing he didn't get in touch with you in any way, Doris. You'd have been implicated. He, uh... Didn't contact you when he hit town? <laughs> of course not. You know how I feel about him, Charlie? Uh-huh. But it was different in Seattle. You were pretty fond of him. Look, I don't like cop killers. Or payroll thieves. Now, look, Charlie, if you called me up Easy, to... Easy, sis. I told you I just wanted to make sure you were okay. Not involved. Well, I'm not. Then, brother, Charlie's happy. Nothing to worry about. No, you can go back to sleep. Wait, wait a minute. What? 
Sis, listen. Keep your apartment dark. Don't answer the door for anybody. What is it? On the radio. They just announced that Steve Yeager gave the police the slip. He's on the loose again. Your hand trembles as you hang up the phone, Doris. Your brother Charlie's warning seems unreal, doesn't it? Like something from a terrible nightmare. Steve Yeager, the man you double-crossed, told the police about, has escaped. And you know that he'll head straight to you. Yes, Doris. You lied when you told your brother you hadn't seen or heard from Steve Yeager, didn't you? Because every bit of the more than $50,000 he got from that payroll job he pulled in Seattle is in your apartment at this very moment because Steve thought it would be safe with you. You look out past the drawn window shades. The street outside appears quiet and empty. Then your heart seems to stop dead still. The kitchen. Someone there. And you recall that you left the back door unlocked. Doris? Miss Chandler, are you home, dear? Oh, Mrs. Fabian. Yes, dear. I just had to come over, see if you'd heard. Goodness, there's been some shooting by the police. Right in our neighborhood. A uh, shooting? They... They killed someone? Oh, I don't think so, dear. It's a criminal. They said on the radio he gave the police the slip. A killer. He shot an officer in Seattle a few months ago. I, uh, I see. It's on the radio. Don't you want to turn it on, dear? Uh, no, no, no. I, I've got to go out. My brother called. He uh, isn't well. I've got to go over there. Oh, you're not going out, dear, alone. I'm well, not afraid. I'll take the car. I just won't sleep until I see that Charles is all right. Oh, of course, but do be careful, child. Goodness, a killer walking the streets. You get on home, Mrs. Fabian. Keep the house locked. Oh, don't worry. I will. Good night, dear. Good night. <laughs> You see your neighbor out the back door, lock it after her, and then quickly hurry to the bedroom and pack a small traveling case. And the last thing before closing the bag, you take the money Steve left, put it in the bag with your clothing. A moment later, you slip quietly out the back door, hurry to the garage, and lift the door. Hello, Doris. Baby. Steve. Yeah, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> Didn't think you'd want to go anyplace without me. One evening recently, while doubling in the role of babysitter, I was telling our neighbor's little son about Santa Claus, how Santa comes all the way down from the North Pole nonstop. Gosh, Marvin, the little fellow exclaimed, Santa Claus must use that famous go-farther gasoline like Daddy does. <laughs> well, reluctantly, I had to admit that Santa uses a sleigh powered by reindeer. But if Santa did use an automobile, you can bet he'd be interested in Signal's good mileage. And since Santa knows quality, he'd certainly appreciate Signal's quick cold weather starting, Signal's lively pickup, Signal's smooth as skating power. That's why you can put Marvin Miller on record as saying, if Santa ever trades Prancer and Dancer and Under and Blitzen for a car, I predict Mr. Claus will power it with Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. It was a terrible moment, wasn't it, Doris? When you opened the garage door and saw Steve Yeager, the killer who'd stolen $50,000 in Seattle, the criminal who turned the money he took over to you for safekeeping, the man you double-crossed by tipping the police off to his presence in the area. And now he stands there, smiling coldly. And you're certain that it's all over, that he's going to kill you. And you're certain, too, that he's guessed it was you who called the police. Your mind struggles for an excuse, doesn't it, Doris? Something to say to Steve by way of explanation. But nothing comes from your lips. And then you realize that he's speaking and nodding toward the car. Come on, I said, in the car. We're getting out of here. 
Steve, Steve, you don't think that I... Save it. Get in the car. You got the keys? Right here. Go ahead, start it. Hey, the uh, dame next door, she came over. What'd you tell her? I, I said I was going to visit my brother. Uh, I, I was, Steve. I, I heard about you on the radio. I thought the police would tie me in with it. I thought if I took the money and hid out until I heard from you... Sure, I, sure. It's the truth, Steve. Here. See, I, I have the money here in this bag. Let's have a look. Uh, uh-huh. That part adds up, Doris. Nice of you to keep it for me. Steve, you've got to believe me. Maybe I will, Doris. Maybe I will. All right now, just keep quiet and drive. Go out sunset towards Beverly Hills. Sure, Steve. Uh, d- don't worry. I'll help you. <laughs> I know you will, baby. I know you will. <laughs> His manner terrifies you, doesn't it, Doris? And you can't believe for a moment that he's satisfied with your explanation. Driving out Sunset Boulevard, you make up your mind. The police must get Steve Yeager before he gets you. At a stoplight at the corner of Sunset and Doheny, there's a slight grade. Just enough to make your car roll back when you stop for the red light. You notice, too, that parked on the opposite corner is a police car. Perfect. Carefully, you ease your foot off the brake pedal. Let the car roll back toward the one in the rear. Hey, take it easy. We've locked bumpers. Oh, you little fool. I'll see what I can do. It's a tense few moments, isn't it, Doris? Steve back trying to free the two cars. You wondering if you can reach the police or if you dare call out to them. And then you notice that one of them has started across the street to see what's wrong. Hey there! He calls out suddenly as Steve gets back in your car. Hastily, Steve shoves you aside, slips behind the steering wheel himself. Steve! Steve, an officer, he's yelling at us. We're not waiting for him. But Shut up, will you? We're getting out of here now. Hey! Stop! <laughs> Through the rearview mirror, you can see the police officer running for his car across the street. He's going to make a chase out of it. And a glance at Steve Yeager tells you that he isn't going to quit easily, doesn't it, Doris? The cars race along Sunset at terrifying speed. Their tires screeching. You beg Steve to stop, to give up. Steve! Steve, he's gaining! Stop it! We'll both be killed! Hang on! We're not beat yet. Uh, Let him try that. Steve! Steve, he didn't make it. He went on past. Yeah, he'll be back. But it gives us time, baby. Time to swing in. Here. You sit beside Steve Yeager in frightened silence. You're parked in the dark, winding driveway of a huge mansion, aren't you, Doris? With Steve taking a chance that the police car will miss you and race on past. And then, a moment later... Yeah, there he goes. <laughs> I told you, baby... We're not through. You ride in silence for several miles and realize that Steve has pointed the car out toward the valley. And then you look over at him and notice the blood on his hand. Steve, your hand. Huh? Oh, yeah. it's from my shoulder. Those cops licked me as I was going over a fence. It ought to be attended to, Steve. A, a bullet wound. Okay, so we have it taken care of. Lonely enough section out here. Yeah, a little ranch house looks deserted enough. Now we'll see if there's anybody inside. Oh, yeah. There's a light. Yeah. Come on, up on the porch. Somebody home, all right, and quite alone. Steve is pleased, isn't he, Doris? You move up beside him until you can see through the window. There's a young man sitting at a desk inside. He's puffing slowly on a pipe, staring at the typewriter before him. All right, baby. You know what to say. 
He's coming. Oh, good evening. Hello. Um, our, our car is stalled out front. Um, may we use your telephone? Oh, why, of course. Come in. Come in. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, look here, old man. What you... Shut the door, baby. Look, what do you think of your... Oh, a gun. Yeah, one that says you're going to be a good boy. Uh, definitely a good boy. Uh, <clears throat> look, if, it, if it's money you want... It isn't. Oh, thank heavens for that. You alone? Alone. Uh, yes, yes, quite alone. That's fine. Do as I say and you won't get hurt. Doris, draw the blinds. Go on. All right. Where's the phone? It's uh, right behind you on the table. Uh, that an extension? Uh, in a little place like this? That's absurd. Yeah, I guess it is at that. And I'll sit right here where I can keep my eye on that phone. You stay away from it, even if it rings, understand? Perfectly. Good. I suppose you get some hot water and something that'll do for bandages. Bandages? Oh, oh, a third member of the party, hmm? Perhaps lying mortally wounded in the car outside. Yes, I see. You don't see. Get moving. Later, Doris, as you dress the wound in Steve's shoulder, you glance from time to time at the tall young man standing by quietly, watching you. There's the faint trace of a smile on his lips. He seems calm, unafraid. And you're certain that if he were given the opportunity, he could overpower Steve. He's your one hope, Doris. What do you do, Junior? I uh, do? Oh, I, I, uh, I write. What do you write? Uh, oh, you know, uh, <clears throat> the crime doesn't pay sort of thing. <laughs> Any good? Uh, not very What's your name? Maybe I read some of your stuff. Oh, I don't think you have, but my name is Anton Gray. Sounds like something off a color chart. It isn't phony, if that's what you mean. Anton Gray, huh? Hey, uh, you ever hear of him, baby? No, I never have. Uh, I guess we... Hey, take it easy. Sorry? You about through with that? Yep, just about. Hey, you got any beer, Anton? No, but there, there's some sherry in the decanter there. Get it. Yes, of course. You might see about getting something to eat. Uh, cold corn beef's all I have. That'll do. All right, Steve, how does that feel? Oh, fine, just fine, baby. A glass of sherry, dear lady? Uh, no, thank you. Oh, here you are, old man. Thanks. Now, uh, the grub, huh? Yes, yeah, right. Uh, won't be a moment. I'd better help him, Steve. Yeah, sure, baby, you do that. But leave the kitchen door open, huh? Oh, Steve, you don't think that Just I... leave the door open. Can I, uh, help? Oh, uh, no, I can manage. It's a rather interesting chap, your friend. My friend? Isn't he? I never saw him before in my life. Oh, I'm sorry. I just naturally assumed... He jumped into my car, forced me to drive away. I see. Um, bread's in the box there. Uh, do you mind? Anton. Yes? Yeah? He's badly wounded. Weak. So? We could overpower him. It'd be easy if you... Oh, I forget it. What? Uh, don't let this cool, calm exterior fool you. I'm... Not a very brave man, really. You're afraid of him. Hey, we haven't got all night, baby. Hurry it up. Uh, uh, okay, Steve. And you're not afraid of him, huh? Neither of us has to be. He... he has a gun. That automatically makes me a coward. Listen to me. If I can draw his attention, you could slip up behind... I'm sorry, I am not the type. What are you two yakking about in there? Let's get going with the grub. Hey, uh, mustard or mayonnaise, old man? <laughs> Anton's not going to help you, is he, Doris? And your one last chance of getting away from Steve has vanished. But later in the living room, a surprising thing happens. Anton casually wanders over to a table near the front window, picks up a cigarette, and then slowly starts to edge toward the fireplace. And suddenly you realize what he's going for, the poker lying on the hearth. Quickly, you dig into your purse for a pack of cigarettes and offer one to Steve. Thanks, baby. As you extend your cigarette lighter, you see Anton pick up the poker, start to raise it over his head. In three short steps, he can reach Steve, can't he, Doris? You hold your breath, but Anton doesn't move. And then Steve leans back in his chair, 
blows a cloud of smoke toward the ceiling. Anton? Uh, yes? Got any coffee? A uh, Coffee? I, I, I guess, yes. Hop to it. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Your heart sinks as you watch Anton replace the poker on the hearth. Drag himself slowly back to the kitchen. A moment later, you follow him. Why didn't you do it? Why? I, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't move. His back was turned. You could have easily... I know, I know, but I kept thinking, suppose I miss. Suppose I miss. He'd have killed me. He'll kill us anyway. But, but he said... You believe him? Look, Anton, he's a killer. What good are we to him now? All he wants to do is get away. And he won't leave anyone around to tip off the police, don't you see? But perhaps he'll just go away. Anton, listen to me. We've got to get him before he gets us. No. No, I, I, I can't. Not even for $50,000? What? He's got $50,000 on him, I know. If you were to knock him out, we could have the money. Share it. $50,000? The two of us. And then we'd share it. No one would ever know. He stares at you for a moment, then throws a quick glance towards Steve sitting in the living room. And you're almost certain he'll do as you say now. Yes, that he'll be willing to take a chance for a share of the $50,000. Back in the other room with Steve, you watch Anton closely. Know he's struggling to make up his mind. Finally, you see him edge toward the fireplace again. You know you've won. To draw Steve's attention away from Anton, you reach over and uh, accidentally upset the sugar bowl. Oh, and Anton sorry. leaps across the room and brings the poker down hard. You've done it, Anton. You've done it. He, he's not... Dead? No, you'd better hit him again. What? Hit him again. No. I, I, I'm i going to call the police. The police? No, you've got to kill him. He'd tell them about the money. Money? I don't want any part of it. I, I'm sorry if you thought I... So that's it. An honest man. Disappointed? Yes. Yes, I am. Well, now, wait a minute. Get back. I have the gun now. You'll do as I say. Yes. Yes, of course. Tie him up, hands behind his back. Use his belt. Whatever you say. First reach into his inside coat pocket. The money's there. Hmm? Oh, oh yes, yes, so it is. Give it to me. Fifty thousand dollars. That's a lot of money, isn't it? Give it to me, I said. Here you are. Now tie him up. His feet, too. That lamp cord will do fine. Yes, of course. And then I'll trouble you for your car keys. Oh, I'm... I'm afraid you'll have to trouble the finance company. What? Uh, well, you see, my financial status being what it is... You're lying. Uh, look, the carport's right alongside the house. Look out of the window. You can see for yourself. Quite empty. All right. Uh, you drove up here in a car, though, didn't you? So we did. But unfortunately, we had an accident, and the police have a description of my car. However, now that I think of it, I don't imagine it'll make much difference. It's night, foggy. And if I do get stopped, I can always tell them that Steve kidnapped me, forced me to help him make his getaway. Oh, well, they're sure to believe it. I did, at first. Hurry up with that, will you? Well, his hands are tied securely. Now oh, his feet... Oh, never mind, never mind. Where does that door lead to? Huh? Oh, a uh, closet. Good. Drag him in there. Hurry up! All right. Now inside, both of you. Yes, as you say, dear lady. Oh, there we are. I hope you'll be quite comfortable. It'll be the first time I've ever spent an evening in a dark closet, but I imagine I'll manage. <clears throat> you see, yes, I have enough cigarettes. Good. I should kill you both, but this way I won't face a murder rap. Besides, all I need is a half-hour start. Nobody will ever think of looking for me where I'm going. Yes, I'm sure you're very clever. Uh, by the way, is there a reward for this chap? There is. You might claim it. I shall. Is there a reward for you, too? <laughs> no. Not me. 
So long, sucker. Have fun with the reward they give you for the capture of Jaeger. Want to make a bet? I'll bet that one of your most faithful friends has been completely left off your Christmas list. Your car. Christmas, you know, is really a swell excuse to give the faithful chariot some of those things it's been needing. Things that'll pay you back later in extra driving pleasure. What's more, your signal dealer has just what Santa ordered. For instance, rugged new tires by Lee of Conshohocken to replace your smooth, dangerous old tires. Powerful new signal deluxe batteries, guaranteed a full 30 months on a service basis. Or how about a set of new Champion or AC spark plugs? for quicker, cold-weather starting and more pep. These are just a few accessories from your signal dealer's complete line, which includes windshield wipers, fan belts, radiator hose, light bulbs, polishes, and many other items. You see, signal service stations are much more than just headquarters for the famous go-farther gasoline. In addition, each signal dealer carries a complete line of fine-quality automotive accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. The fog that had settled over the Los Angeles area during the night had lifted now, and the morning sun was shining as Lieutenant Avery of the Los Angeles police stepped out of the hospital room and walked down the quiet corridor. As he reached the elevator, a young man, a member of the local press, came forward to meet him. Okay, Lieutenant, she must be pretty important for you to come all the way down here. Who is she? Doris Chandler. Chandler? Mm-hmm. The woman Steve Yeager kidnapped last night? Hey, what goes? She was involved in a traffic accident, only she wasn't kidnapped. Uh, was she hurt bad? Uh, she'll be around here for some time, a doc says. But she'll recover in time to stand trial as Yeager's accomplishment. She had the 50000 he stole with her in the car. Well, how did you stop her? We didn't. A truck smashed into the rear end of her car on Rosita Boulevard. It was a bad fog. The truck driver said he didn't see her in time to avoid the crash. No taillight on her car. No taillight, huh? <laughs> That's his story. That checks all right. According to a report turned in by squad car officers, a Chandler woman's car was involved in a minor accident earlier last night. Witnesses said she deliberately backed into another car at Doheny and Sunset. That's when her taillight was smashed. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you, during this busy pre-holiday season, it's especially important to drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations, so that some avoidable accident doesn't mar your Merry Christmas. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Alice Reinhardt, Jack Moyles, Ben Wright, Norma Varden, Herbert Litton, and Bob Bruce. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Steve Hampton, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on the Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>